Thank you. So, Karen and I are both uh, life members of Clyde Salamat Rowing Club, both ex-presidents as well, in fact. In today's talk will take us through the, the context of the volunteer input uh, in this project, and um, behind the West Boat House project, and it will take us up to about a year ago, um, which was a particularly exciting time in the, the long development of this project. There were two rowing clubs here in the West Boat House. Both are entirely volunteer-run members' clubs, which seek to promote the sport of rowing. Like most sports clubs, they exist to focus uh, on their own sport. They aren't experts in built heritage, or in tourism, or marketing, fundraising, or consultation. They're just experts in rowing, or at least many of them, <laughs> many of them think they are. <laughs> so, the rowers, they're, uh, yeah, you might offend Karen here and have described them as being a boring backward bunch that are mostly only interested in doing boaty stuff, um, but, you know, properly focused on that boaty stuff, obsessively focused on that boaty stuff. <laughs> Some of them will train, you know, 12 times a week. And that obsession makes it hard to engage volunteers in things that are out with their primary focus or the reason that they're involved in that activity. But when you do get their attention, you tend to get a fairly thorough and enthusiastic contribution. The West Boat House was built in 1905 by the Glasgow Corporation for the two tenant rowing clubs. That's Clydesdale, which is our club, founded in 1857, and Clyde, the next door neighbours, who were founded in 1865. The building is still owned by Glasgow City Council. It's a timber frame construction and it's got a few issues. Its condition is often misunderstood, not least by the building owners, um, but that timber frame is the reason that it still stands today when any other construction type on that particular site would probably have fallen into the river by now. Concerned at the state of the building, in the mid-1990s, Clydesdale asked the local authority, the building owners, for a long lease so that the club could lever the funding to try and secure the future of their home. Council declined, who at that time were favouring a solution for all of the rowing clubs on the Clyde. You might not necessarily associate Glasgow with rowing, but there are actually six clubs, all within the space of a kilometre of each other, um, which is quite something. Um, but in 1998, Glasgow City Council told the clubs that they had two years to vacate the building and to find alternative accommodation. And they were being nudged in the direction of having a big shared new build uh, project on Glasgow Green. And so it begins. Between 1998 and 2015, the clubs were blighted by this idea of a new boathouse project, and there are various iterations of proposals, um, some more horrific than others. 2007 looks like an absolute <coughs> belter. Um, <coughs> and basically, there was a 17 year standoff between the local authority and the clubs, with the local authority expecting the clubs to have the capacity to deliver a multi million pound capital project, and the clubs is expecting the council to do everything for them. Um, and eventually, I think it was uh, 2013 or so, it became apparent that you know, it was really up to the clubs to try and deliver this, um, which was an, a fairly unreasonable prospect at the time. Um, and eventually, uh, two of the clubs that have been part of that, those, uh, those discussions had just got fed up. Such was their concern for the state of the, the listed building that they had to address uh, the future of their very existence. Um, but the desire to stay in the West Boat House didn't start in 2013, it didn't start in 2015, it started a lot earlier than that. Many of the long-standing members of, uh, of the rowing clubs consider this place to be their second home. Um, and once, uh, I think it was 2005 or so, it was actually the centenary of the, the building, and there was a wee sort of celebration within the boathouse, and one of the architectural students who was a member there had done some measured drawings, and that just got everybody started thinking a bit more about this particular building. In 2010, we had uh, a couple of members who had recently joined who, who could see the potential of this building and they set about redecorating the inside of the building and putting on display some of the historic images that they knew existed, um, which most of the membership were entirely oblivious of. Um, so in this photo we see some of, the, some of the photos of when the building was opened. And that was a, a fairly transformational change, I think, in, in much of the membership of the club, um, who were becoming increasingly proud of their sporting heritage, of their club and of the building. A, fa a facility that had previously been a bit of an embarrassment in recent years given its condition had now, been come, had now become a source of pride. <coughs> clubs, clubs started to participate in doors open days 
um, and they were, they were pleased to show people about the club. They weren't entirely sure what they were letting themselves in for, but they were absolutely delighted when visitors were as interested in the sport and in the history of the club um, as they were in the, in, in the building. Um, but more, more importantly, I think, or, or more comfort to the, the, the club volunteers, was people were fascinated by this idea of getting out on the river. And that's not something that happens uh, elsewhere uh, on the Clyde in Glasgow. Um, but unknowingly, the volunteers were developing their own skills um, at curating about what to put in display, how to provide a relevant tour, and providing hospitality. And then in 2015, the club set about this feasibility study. Um, and when they started this process, the response was overwhelming. The Architectural Heritage Fund and the Heritage Lottery Fund um, provided some grant assistance to support the feasibility study um, so that the clubs could redevelop their historic home. This photo was taken from the briefing session for the feasibility study, where Scotland's urban past um, encouraged the volunteers to research their archives and to share some of the heritage that they'd uncovered but also to contribute ideas about what is relevant about that heritage and how they could share that with a wider audience. Um, ideas for how the clubs could engage a wider audience and get more people active on the river were provided on the evening, and more was achieved in two hours during this, this session than had been achieved previously in the, in, the, in the previous 17 years. So I'm about to show you about a dozen images which were collected in that evening, and they've all got a different relevance, um, which has informed the later development of this project. This is one of the earliest images, which we think was in the late 1800s. Um, rowing on the Clyde, of course, predates the clubs. It predates the building as well. Um, and this is an image um, at low tide. So it's before the development of the tidal weir. And you can see there just the number of boats that are on the, on the water, um, all of different sort of shapes and sizes, and doing different things. And that's something that's, coming, that's being teased out in the later development of this project. Um, but there, you know, we need to be encouraging more use of the river in this location. I'm not sure how clear these are coming out, but these are some of the particularly old documents which were uncovered by one of the veterans. Um, you can see here a, 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 a note of the hire of boats in 1860, which demonstrates that even back then there was, there was much more activity in, the, in Glasgow around the provision of vessels to get on the water. Um, but also establishing some of those connections throughout the city. Again, something that has been lost in more recent years. On the bottom right is an invite to the formal opening of the, of the new boathouse, the West Boathouse, in 1905. And there's another invite up above uh, in 1914 where women were only cordially invited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but here are some of, some of those women cordially assembled in bonnets. Um, and this photo shows some of the aspects of the building which have been lost. Uh, typically the plasterwork coin detailing to the corners. Um, interestingly, this is a, a photo from uh, the, the opening of the building, in fact, um, which shows the, the colour of the windows, which is going to become relevant in later discussions that we've been having with Historic Scotland, um, which I'll touch on. This is one of the, the, the best images, I think, of the building. We think it was taken about 1910, maybe, maybe just before the First World War. Um, and this has prompted a lot of discussion with Historic Scotland who are quite keen on a, a colour scheme for the building which is much, much darker um, and they are actually nudging it towards this idea of being council green. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll come back to that one later. This is a fairly... Um, it doesn't look as if it's all that interesting, a, a little note that we found, um, but it indicates that there's been an in, a bit of an issue with the, the cladding on the building. Now, this is a timber frame structure. Uh, it's, on a, it's on a riverside site, as water levels vary, the building will flex and adapt, and a timber, timber frame structure can do that. Um, at some point, the, the external cladding was replaced with something that was, uh, was heavyweight and inflexible, and that's, that's a big part of what the condition that you see the building in today. What we find particularly interesting is that these complaints were coming up in 1914. So the building wasn't particularly old um, when these flaws started to emerge. Other images that came forward were perhaps a bit more predictable and perhaps not, not, not any less important as many of the club members who take part in the sport um, have been taking part as, as one of a series of, of over several generations. Many of the men pictured in here are still active, in fact, uh, on the water every week. However, there's a limit to how appealing this sort of material might be to a wider audience. Another image from the 60s. 
I think, tells uh, a little bit more about the nature of the use of the river. Um, mo most notably here um, is that there are no women uh, participating. For many years, women's involvement in the club was in supporting and encouraging the men, uh, or as in this image, uh, ceremonially naming and launching one of the boats. Um, I was at an event down in, down in London last week where they've been doing a lot of research into women drawing and the history of it and how, um, how would you say, it, um, unladylike at the time it was considered for women to be taking part in such a strange activity. And I'm going to hand over to Karen and talk about some of the nature of women drawing in, in the clubs. Very briefly, here on Equal Pay Day, I am <laughs> here to talk on behalf of the women of Clydesdale Amateur Rowing Club. I was one of the first mem female members of Clydesdale Amateur Rowing Club, not from 1857, as Andrew has mentioned. There were no women members at that time, but from around about 1980, which was when the AGM in Clydesdale uh, voted to permit women into the club. That was following three failed attempts prior to that in the 60s where um, it had been proposed, or sorry, in the 70s when it had been proposed and knocked back. On the day that it was voted in, three members voted against uh, and everyone else we believe voted for, I don't think there was any abstentions. But we promptly joined out at that time as a junior and was, was rowing but out of school uh, with a school teacher who had a husband in Clydesdale Rowing Club and we promptly, with her, were the first female members of the club and happily have been there ever since. And, and, and to some extent have lived through all of that period of um, un uncertainty around where the boathouse is going, but uh, getting to this point. And I, I, as Andrew said, I was a, a president of the club uh, a few years ago. Not the first female president, but the second. And we now have a, another female president as well. But I, took, I had roles as uh, assistant secretary, secretary, treasurer, vice president, and so on. And uh, I think women in the club have added a huge amount in terms of their... their um, volunteering. I just wanted to note the boat that was being launched there um, I noted was called the Isla and I think that's probably in the 60s or something. That boat was still being used when I joined in 1980 and we prior to joining when we were still at school we got to borrow boats from Clydesdale at Regattas if we did some baking for the tea room and that was the boat, the very first boat I raced in. Amazing. Anyway, I'm here for a bit of the oral history stuff as well. <laughs> and is that is that an image that looks familiar to you, Karen, from maybe your first involvement it in the is. sport? And this is this is also something I, I, that's quite interesting to me. I didn't know about. We will surely be commencing the weekly trial test. No action is required. I repeat, no action is required. Stop. <laughs> It's a, yeah, 12.30, so oh, no, right. it's rough too, but... Okay. <laughs> you know, this is my very first memory of Clydesdale Amateur Rowing. I didn't know it was Clydesdale Amateur Rowing at the club at the time, but I had an aunt who stayed in the high flats across the river, and I used to go and visit her on Saturdays and stand on the balcony and look down and wonder what on earth's going on there. And that was, that was my first ever memory. I never knew I'd end up there, but there we go. What, what we find quite interesting about this, this image is that you hear from the, the rowers lots of stories about different landmarks all the way up the river, where, whether it's the, the power station up at Domarnock, or whether it's the fantastic uh, sewage works, or the, the Cowan's, Cowan's Bend and the, the confectionery factory that was up there. But all these stories, you never hear about the bandstand in Glasgow Green, interestingly, and what a wee cutie that building is, um, but you know, long since lost. So that, that, might, that might tweak a wee bit of curiosity. Uh, in the later <coughs> development of the club. So we've got other landmarks on the, ri on the river, but we've also got other events. And I wonder, Karen, if you can maybe tell us. Yeah, this, was, this was also my, my first um, experience of a grand event at Clydesdale just shortly after the women were permitted to join. And this was the 125th anniversary of the founding of the club when we had a flotilla with all of the boats that we had in the clubhouse float, uh, parading down the river in, in, in formation. And that's me there. <laughs> Our very first <laughs> official duty as a member of Clydesdale Rowing Club in the flotilla. Yeah. Good memories. Some of, some of the other images that came forward have been much more informative for the development of the project that GVT are now leading on. This was one, again, in the 80s, um, where the club members were taking it upon themselves to replace one of the, the timber posts. Um, so you can see here that they've, they're just about to remove... Uh, one minute, oh gosh, right, <laughs> need to speed up. Um, but this exposed that, uh, a bit of better understanding about the timber substructure to the building. And then this was essentially recreated during that feasibility study where we're looking to, to determine whether or not some of that timber substructure could be, 
could be reused. Um, and this is a great one where the volunteers have just got totally stuck in. When they were clearing the building uh, to enable the, the, the inspections of the, the, the timber frame, it gave the club members a much better understanding of, of that timber structure, because invariably there's always boats concealing it, and they don't necessarily know what it is they've been looking at. This was uh, an event at the end of the feasibility study where the clubs invited in local community members. For many of them, it was the first time they'd ever been in the building, having walked past it on an almost daily basis. This was a, an extra activity done as part of the feasibility study. It came from a suggestion by one of the junior members, so a 14 or 15 year old girl came up with this idea to display some of these images that were collected uh, in conjunction with Scotland's Urban Pass and display them on these blocked up windows on the outside. And as a consequence, that has meant that many people are stopping and having a reread and finding a bit more about the history of rowing and the, and the boathouse. And it's led to many an impromptu tour of the building. Um, <laughs> Um, attention, so please. <laughs> attention, please. <laughs> Fire has been reported in the building. Please leave the building. Probably. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to skip over this, but again, this is where historic Scotland are quite keen to progress with Council Green on the windows. Um, but this is Doors Open Day 2016, and this is really what the clubs do best. It's about providing access to the river for all sorts of different people who haven't been getting out in the river before. Um, and then just. Actually, I can't tell you about that, I don't have the time. But we'll skip on to the next one, which was maybe the highlight of the 2016 uh, Doors Open Day, uh, Karen, about yeah. the, the oral history. You can history. ask me a question about it, but I, but, but, uh, I, I and a little group put together the oral history with uh, help from Scotland Urban, uh, Scotland's Urban Pass, which is fantastic, but we can follow up with the question if you want on that. Okay. Uh, that then concludes the <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Good. So lastly, the other amazing thing that volunteers <laughs> did with this project was when GBPT were doing a crowdfunding exercise as towards the development of the project, the volunteers were all over this like a rash and the rowing network is just is so wide and varied with people contributing from Texas, from Singapore, from New Zealand um, and that was timed coincidentally enough um, around the time of the Heritage Lottery Fund's decision about a round, a round one award. Um, and of course, the, in the end, <laughs> in the end, the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, were very, very supportive of the project, and a round one award was made. So um, the project is moving on great leaps and bounds now, uh, with the assistance of Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, incidentally where I work. Um, and yeah, it's it's been a very exciting time, but none of it, none of it at all, would have been possible without that uh, enthusiasm and momentum that's been generated by the volunteers.